Manipulation of the democratic process is now well underway as fundamentalists take control of education, intelligent design, single faith schools. The media, God Channel, Fox TV. The law, Supreme Court, blasphemy, they're trying to bring in the, to really put the blasphemy law and make it um, sort of apply to Islam in the UK. Government, Bush, Blair, Nigeria, Iran. The war, however, and I think this is the important point, is fragmented in that it is being waged in different regions by a variety of movements which have one thing in common, blind faith in fundamentalist dogma. These anti-democratic movements are intrinsically antagonistic, however, as they generally are intensely na nationalistic and therefore exert only parochial influence. Throughout all these regions, there are, exist vast numbers of individuals who share an alternative but common philosophy, rationality. These people have a cross-national, multicultural, and global coherent cultural identity. One figure is this one from Hawaii. I was really staggered that unaffiliated up here, the green laws, is actually higher than Christian, Buddhist, Jews, and others. Okay? I believe that there are people out there. And I gave a, a lecture like this in Tallahassee, and the most wonderful moment was this elderly gentleman came to see me and said, you know, I don't feel so alone anymore. And I think what Richard found is there are people that we need now to say, we've got to come out. This is a sort of McCarthy era against um, not so much atheism, but people who don't accept Christianity or whatever. And I think this, we should do something about it. The global reach of the internet and the possibility of mobilizing action on a global scale may offer a ray of hope in withstanding the assault that is now underway. Through the internet, one can instantaneously communicate with people worldwide who share this common philosophy. I think the last chance is to find a way in which members of this global community can coordinate their efforts to save the secular safeguards that have been won since the time of Galileo and are implicitly stated in the wonderful, most wonderful document of the US Constitution by Jefferson and uh, Thomas Paine and uh, Adams and Benjamin Franklin. And I think we've seen some effect, and that is it worked against apartheid. There was a sort of global altruistic approach which said, this is wrong, let's do something about it, and Exxon Valdez. It should be possible to move all our efforts in those ways. Distortion of the democratic process, Regent of School of Law, Pat Robertson's university, focuses on journalism and law. News Corporation, I love this channel. They always agree with every word I say. Okay. Uh, we see God channels all over the place. I mean, I just can't believe it. Uh, and these things are out there. We need a C-SPAN for science. And Roger, I think we've got to help you to actually get this thing on the road, backed up by an internet channel. My heroes. Well, we talked about heroes. I don't know that I like heroes, but let's just call them heroes because I can't think of a better one. Joe Rotblatt, he was the uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner uh, for his work with Pugwash. Okay, absolutely fantastic guy. Go, and go to our website and listen to him talking. Jacob Bronowski, the Ascent of Man. There's never been a better set of programs for science. Here he is playing with his grandson. Carl Sagan. Fantastic book. I carry this wherever I go. And, say, and if you want to know the dangers of not doubting, they're in this book. I like this one. One of the great commands of science, mistrust arguments for authority. I, that's the, one of my heroes, too. But not the old geezer who was as decrepit as I am now, but the young guy. He was actually 17 when he first started thinking. I mean, this is the problem. Science is tarred by the, the image of the old guy. And these are some of mine, Jim Heath and Sean O'Brien, who, um, who actually helped us to make the discovery of C60. Young scientists, Yuan Liu now at Oak Ridge, and Jonathan Hare in the UK. These are the people that we should be celebrating and giving out, putting out there as iconic images for young people to actually follow. Unfortunately, it's not that. It's people like this guy. <laughs> and he's a Scientologist. Okay. Now, that's a serious problem, it seems to me. How is this? Well, we should be celebrating people like Richard Feynman. The freedom to doubt is an important matter in the sciences, I believe, and in other fields. It was born out of a struggle. It was a struggle to be permitted to doubt, to be unsure. And I do not want to forget the importance of that struggle and by default let it fall away. If you know you're unsure, you have a chance to change the situation. 
I like this. I want to demand this freedom for future generations. I think we've got a problem in saving that. I think we're stepping backwards and we must do something about it. I come to the USA and therefore to some extent starting to immerse myself a little bit in American culture. But this is the most cogent statement of sign I've ever seen. I like the scientific spirit, the holding off, the being sure, and this is the wonderful line, but not too sure. That encapsulates science. The willingness to surrender ideas when the evidence is against them. This is ultimately fine, and this fantastic statement at the end, it keeps the way beyond open. It is a tremendous uh, perceptive statement about science, which I haven't seen any, any scientist make so well. Thomas Paine, well, I have to show it because he, he lived in my hometown, Lewis. Uh, my Marg and I live near here, um, about a mile from this house. I know it says the rights of man. Oh, we've got the rights of man and woman, men of humanity. You will do me justice to remember that I have always supported the right of man to his own opinion, however different that opinion be from mine. He who denies another this right makes a slave of himself to his present opinion because he precludes himself the right of changing it. I have a problem with this, but I know it's right when I talk to someone who's strongly religious. <laughs> we have to recognize this, and I don't know how, how we do reconcile that. Anyway, the biggest problem I see in the USA, the change from the early 60s, the swinging 60s, the time when we lived uh, in Canada for two years and the States for a year, is something that I think you'll see in Benjamin Franklin. Um, Mike, Michael Kasher, my friend at FSU, showed me this. He, he pointed out this wonderful page. The Indians were exceedingly gracious to strangers, setting aside a special house in each village to accommodate visitors, and were exemplars of toleration. Franklin wrote of a missionary who told the Susquehanna the story of, the, of Adam's fall and how it had led to great travail and necessitated Jesus' suffering and death. When he had finished, an Indian orator stood up to thank him. Franklin related with a twinkle in either his own eye or the Indian's. What you have told us is all very good. It is indeed bad to eat apples. <laughs> it's better to make them all into cider. I think the US over the last few years has lost its sense of humor, at least up there on television, the, the, the comedy programs aren't there. I don't see it in the politics. And it, I think life without a sense of humor is wasted. So basically, I suddenly realized my, our little boy, um, David, once said something that always rings, and I always remember saying, them that dies be the lucky ones. Um, I think that's atheism for you. Thank you very much. <laughs>